Okay, so hi everyone. And um, today we're super happy to have uh, Professor Colin Ruffle um, to be our speaker. Dr. Colin Ruffle is an assistant professor in computer science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He is also a faculty researcher at Hugging Face. He finished his PhD at Columbia University and was a recipient of fellowship and travel grants from NSF. He is the first author of the very impactful T5 model and the co-author of the trans transfer learning and semi-supervised learning section in the probabilistic machine learning textbook. Recently, his research focuses on machine learning algorithms for learning from limited labeled data, while today's talk is about a visionary call to build models like open source software. With much excitement, let's welcome Professor Raffo. Thanks a lot. Thanks for that really generous introduction. So um, as, as we were just saying, I'm, I'm happy to have people stop me and ask questions or feel free to put questions in the chat. I'll, I also will stop, I think twice during this talk to ask if there are any questions. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's just go ahead and get started. So let's talk a bit about transfer learning. I don't think I'm gonna to have to convince anyone here of this, but uh, transfer learning has become a hugely impactful paradigm uh, in, in machine learning recently. Um, let's start by giving an introduction. Again, this might be reviewed for everyone here, but let's all get on the same page. So uh, when we say transfer learning, we just mean that uh, rather than taking a model and directly training it on the task that we care about, we're gonna first train it on some other task, and then we will fine tune it on the task we care about, which is usually called the downstream task. And doing this first step of training it on a different task often makes it converge faster to a better solution with less labeled data, which are all really wonderful things. So to give an example of, of this pipeline, uh, here's the common transfer learning setup from image classification, where the model is first pre-trained on the ImageNet data set, which is a very large data set of labeled images coming from about a thousand classes. And after that pre-training stage on ImageNet, we can then take a pre-trained model and fine tune it on a downstream task like mushroom identification, uh, where maybe we don't have as much labeled data, uh, but nevertheless, by using the ImageNet pre-training step, we can get a high quality model for identifying different mushrooms, even though we don't have much labeled data and maybe the model will also converge faster as I, as I mentioned before. So we usually would call this first stage of training on ImageNet a supervised pre-training stage. Uh, in natural language processing, it's become more common to do an unsupervised pre-training stage. For example, here we're showing the model is going to be pre-trained by taking chunks of text and randomly removing words and then training the model to fill in the blanks. So the model is going to be trained to fill in the words that are in bold in the yellow box. After doing this unsupervised pre-training step, we can then fine tune our model on the downstream task. For example, what's shown here is a sentiment analysis task where the model needs to predict whether a movie review is positive or negative. And again, by including this pre-training stage, we end up getting typically much better performance from less labeled data on the downstream fine tuning task. So to convince you that this is a really nice paradigm, let's actually look at what transfer learning has done to uh, various application areas. So this is the performance over time of on this, the squad benchmark, which is a reading comprehension benchmark, which means that the model was fed a paragraph and a question about the paragraph, and then had to extract the answer from the paragraph. And you can see that performance on this benchmark has gone up over time, which is great, but notably, you can kind of separate the different solutions or submissions to this benchmark into two categories. Those that did not use the form of transfer learning that I introduced at the beginning of the talk and those that did. Uh, and actually the ones that are labeled no transfer learning here did use maybe a slight form of transfer learning called word embeddings. Uh, but let's ignore that for now. I'm really talking about the paradigm of pre-training the whole model and then fine tuning the whole model. And if we, if we focus on that, then indeed there is this huge boost in performance that has come from using transfer learning methods on benchmarks like Squad. We can also look at a, a very, very popular and longstanding benchmark from speech recognition called Timit, which is a phoneme recognition task. You can think of it like speech recognition. And Timit has actually been around much longer than is shown on this uh, timeline. But nevertheless, you can see that over a period of about six years, there were no real major improvements in performance on Timit, uh, 
Uh, but recently, when people really started developing powerful transfer learning methods for speech, there was a huge boost in performance that really hadn't been seen before on this benchmark. And to really drive it home uh, with pre-trained models for images, it is so popular, so common to use a pre-trained ImageNet model that, for example, in the PyTorch Torch Vision models library, it is just as easy to initialize a random architecture as it is to initialize it using the pre-trained parameters from pre-training on ImageNet. All you do is just pass in the pre-trained equals true argument to the constructor for these different models. It's, it's really that, that simple because it's so popular and so standard of a thing to do when attacking computer vision problems, especially classification problems. Uh, so that's all wonderful and great. And I, I, as I said at the beginning, I probably don't have to convince you of the utility of pre-trained models and the utility of, of transfer learning. But now let's talk about kind of some negative aspects of it. And the first negative aspect I'll mention is that pre-training these models can be quite expensive because pre-training is typically done on a very uh, data rich task, like the ImageNet benchmark, which has a huge number of labeled images or uh, training on a very large collection of unstructured text. And also, as we've all seen in recent years uh, in, in machine learning, training larger models tends to perform better. Uh, and that is especially true in the transfer learning setting. So as an extreme example of the cost of training a large model on a large data set, we can look to GPT-3, whose training cost was estimated at about $5 million, which you know, in the scheme of the world's economy maybe isn't a lot of money, but in the scheme of the average researcher's budget is quite a lot of money. I imagine most people on this call uh, can't uh, uh, go home after the talk and launch a $5 million training run. I might be wrong, but that would be my guess. So the fact that it's so expensive excludes most of us from the development of the pre-trained models. <clears throat> and it means that the design decisions and the experimentation it, that are involved in the creation of these models are left to people who have access to lots of resources, whether they're economic resources or just computational resources. So it means most of us are excluded and that's a worrisome and negative thing, at least to me. And you can see that uh, a, a concrete example of that, if you go to the Hugging Face Model Hub, which is a collection of pre-trained models and look at the most popular models, the ones that have been downloaded the most. And you can see that most of them were released by resource rich organizations, uh, mostly companies. Um, and uh, indeed uh, the training of these models has gotten expensive enough that a lot of the pre-trained models that are being developed, especially for natural language uh, processing tasks are now being held behind APIs. Because if I am a company and I spend $5 million to train a model, I might not do the generous thing and release the model. Uh, instead, I may create an API and charge people for using the model. And to the extent that large pre-trained models are useful artifacts for everyone, and also useful artifacts to study for research purposes, which is what I think those are the people on the call care about. Uh, it's, a, again, a little bit worrisome that the cost of these models has made it so that we many people can't actually access them or have to pay money to access them. <clears throat> now, so that's one issue, which is the cost of training the models. Another issue uh, I will motivate by creating kind of, first by creating kind of a family tree of one particular pre-trained model that I helped develop called T5 uh, that was men mentioned in, in my generous uh, introduction. And so T5 is a pre-trained model, a pre-trained language model. Uh, and I, I won't go into much specifics here, but yeah, we released the model a few years ago. And since then people have used the model to create new models. So let's, let's talk about some of those. So uh, one example is the unified QA model, which took T5 and trained it on kind of a multi data set mixture of question answering tasks. And unified QA was later uh, taken and adapted into another model called Macaw, which was trained on kind of a broader set of question answering style tasks. And both of these models were released by the Allen Institute. T5 was also fine-tuned on a mixture of common sense reasoning data sets uh, by, by the Allen Institute to create another model called Unicorn. Uh, and Unicorn, Unified QA, and Macaw 
are all kind of, you can think of them as uh, directly derived models because they're just models that underwent additional training on different data sets. Another way to have kind of a descendant model is if you take the original model architecture and maybe change it a bit or change the pre-training data set and retrain it from scratch. So one example of that is the T5.1.1 model that we released, which is kind of a updated version of T5 that works a bit better and is only trained on unlabeled data. Uh, T5.1.1 was then adapted via kind of a standard next step prediction language modeling task to create the T5 plus LM models by some of my colleagues or former colleagues, I should say, at Google. And finally, the T5 plus LM model was recently adapted by some of us in the big science effort to create a model called T0 by training the T5 plus LM model on a multitask mixture of lots of prompted data sets. Uh, T5 was also used as the base for the MT5 model, the multilingual T5 model, which was used as the inspiration for the byte T5 model, which is the byte level T5 model. And also T5 was used as inspiration for a bunch of other models like the EXT5 model, a very large scale multitask model, code T5 model, a language model for code, pro T5, a language model for protein sequences. So there's quite a few of these models out there. And I should also mention that if you go to the Hugging Face Model Hub, you can find lots of models that were you that were basically fine-tuned versions of T5. So we've kind of built this family tree of T5 to some extent, and it's which is maybe fun, a little self-congratulatory and fun to do. But the reason that I'm actually doing this is actually to make the point that while I can sit down and make this slide and explain it to you, there's no principled way to figure out what the lineage of a particular model is. So if I just give you the T0 checkpoint, there's no way for you to know that T0 is derived from T5 plus LM, which is derived from T5.1.1, which is based on T5, right? You might be able to read my read the research papers and kind of figure that out for yourself, but there's, there's no system, there's no tooling or principled way for tracking the history of these models, despite the fact that there is clearly some motivation and use cases for sort of continually improving these models over time by taking an existing model and making it better in some way or changing it in some way, okay? And so I will now contrast those issues with pre-trained models with a, another set of valuable things, which are open source software, okay? So I'm sure all of you, whether you know it or not, and you probably do know it, have used lots of open source software in your life, uh, either directly or incorrectly. Uh, it includes things like the Apache web server, uh, various programming languages like PHP and Python, the Linux operating system, the Firefox web browser, lots and lots and lots of open source software exists and is very, very, very widely used. And the key component of open source software, the reason that we call it open source is because the development of many of these software packages is a open and collaborative process. So in principle, for many of these software libraries, anyone can, from around the world can say, I think you should modify this software in this way. And the people who maintain the library can decide whether they want to incorporate that change or not. And the software as a result, kind of just is continually improved. It gets better and better and better over time. And there are, major differences between that development process and the way that pre-trained models are developed, which will be kind of the main subject of my talk. Uh, to give you another kind of picture of, of one of the benefits of open source software development, we can look at kind of the lineage trees of Linux distribution. So this is kind of like the family tree of T5 that I showed, but these are the family trees for Linux distributions. And you can see that for Linux distributions, we can take an existing uh, distribution of Linux and create a derivative version of it and start maintaining that instead. And that's where you see these kind of forks in these graphs. And, but the key difference here is that all of this development is very precisely tracked through a system called uh, version control. And version control keeps track of how software changes over time and also what the constituent parts of a soft, where, where the constituent parts of a piece of software came from. And by the way, if you, these are uh, not the clearest screenshots of these trees. If you wanna see the full diagram, and they're also truncated, but if you wanna see the full diagram, you can visit the URL on the bottom of the screen. So in order to 
take ideas from open source software development and, and apply them to pre-trained models, we're going to need to think through how we can create systems like this that allow us to keep track of the history of a model and also collaborate on a particular model. So in order to kind of describe this, uh, these changes that I think we'll have to make to pre-trained model development, I will first give a quick overview of how version control works, which is kind of the underlying tool that provides a backbone for open source software development. Uh, so in version control, the basic idea is that if a developer writes some code, they can say, I want to start keeping track of this piece of code. And then later, if they decide they want to modify the code or the software in some way, they can create what's called a patch. And the patch basically describes the local modifications to the code in order for it to change in some useful way or meaningful way. Okay, And the version control system then keeps track of the patches and the history of patches. Notably, someone can come along and take the piece of software that is being developed and tracked and they can fork it, which means that they're going to create their own copy of the history of the software, and then they can apply their own patch to it. Uh, maybe this new developer has decided they want to add some functionality or fix maybe a bug in the software, so they fork it and they create their own patch. And then notably, they can communicate it back to the uh, maintainer of the library, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, but if you imagine in the meantime that the core maintainer, the core developer of the library has made their own change. Now the question is, how can we, or should we combine these two changes? So in order to decide, the maintainer of the library can test the proposed change, uh, decide, judge for themselves whether they wanna keep it or not, and then decide, okay, I am going to keep this. And this is the uh, hand symbol for okay, by the way, if you didn't know that. And crucially, version control provides a way of merging the two patches, the one that came from the contributor's fork and the patch that was made by the maintainer in parallel. And merging just means that we're going to combine the two changes, ideally without breaking the software, while keeping it functioning the way that it should and incorporating the functionality from both of the changes. Later, someone else can create their own fork, uh, create a patch, the maintainer can test it, judge it, and decide, no, I don't want to keep that patch. And maybe the contributor is a little sad about this, but the good news is that they can actually keep developing their fork completely independently of the main fork. And actually, that's how most of the Linux distributions in that tree diagram I showed came about. And version control provides uh, meaningful ways to do this. And Beyond all of these development steps, it's also important to note that version control keeps the full history of the software. So if someone comes along and they want to use the software at a particular version, it's very easy for them to do so. So now at this point in the talk, you might all be, or some of you might be thinking to yourselves, yeah, version control makes a lot of sense. Open source software development makes a lot of sense. But I sort of thought we already had that for machine learning model development. You know, I've heard of these systems like MLflow, DVC, weights and biases, some of the functionality that Hugging Face provides, Comet ML. Don't, aren't those version control systems for models? And they are in some sense. And to give us a sense of, give, to give you an idea of that sense, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how DVC specifically works. Uh, DVC is a very powerful system for keeping track of the history of a model. And the way that it does it is by basically keeping track of different, let's say, model checkpoints. So different, uh, uh, binary blobs that correspond to the model's parameters. And it keeps track of the history of it, which is quite useful because if I, you know, train my model on new data, I want to be able to say, you know, here's my new version of the model, and it was based on this previous version of the model. But, and, and you know, again, the way that this is, the way that this works is that somewhere there are these kind of blobs of data that correspond to the model parameters, and DVC refers to those blobs over time. Uh, but the the key distinction that I'd like to make here is that because they are storing entire model checkpoints, there are important version control operations that are maybe impractical or, or impossible to achieve in this setting. For example, if I am training my model, I'm creating my, the history of my model over time, and you take one the model at a particular point in time and you train it a bit and create a new checkpoint, now we have two copies of the model. How do we merge them together? How do we create, how do we do a merge in version control parlance? 
Similarly, if you have created your change to the model and you want to communicate it back to me, you would have to communicate the full set of parameters to your model. And that might be very expensive, especially for the large scale models that we all are training these days. Um, so while this is a uh, system that keeps track of the history of a model, I wouldn't say that it implements all of the functionality of a traditional version control system. So the main purpose of my talk today is to show you two very small steps towards making what I would say is a true version control system for machine learning models. And the two small steps that we're going to take are towards making patches for machine learning models, which are cheaply communicable updates to a particular model, as well as merging models. So taking two models that are based on the same model and combining them together without sacrificing performance. And those are, again, I'm, I'm providing two small steps towards two components of building a system that would enable collaborative and continual development of pre-trained machine learning models. And I'll talk about each of those uh, pieces in turn, but I'll stop just for one quick moment in case anyone has any questions so far. I had one quick question here. Um, how do you envision unit tests fitting into this picture with model development? So, so would it be things like like running the model on something like glue or you're thinking of something more uh, quick? Uh, yeah, I think that's a, that is a super important piece of the sort of open source development ecosystem that I won't be attacking in this talk today. I'm, I'm gonna mention it as future work at the end of the talk, but I do think it's super important and I, I'm mentioning for future work because we, we in my lab haven't done any work on this yet. Um, but yeah, I think the tricky thing is that when talking about a pre-trained model, if we wanna test its capabilities, usually what we do is we fine tune it and then evaluate its performance on, on glue, for example, like you said. But fine tuning and evaluation is actually pretty expensive. Um, so it might really slow down the development pipeline if every time I update my pre-trained model, I have to fine tune it on a bunch of tasks and evaluate its performance in particular, because usually we hope that our pre-trained model is applicable to tons of tasks. Um, and so I think developing methods to rapidly test a model uh, without having to do a new stage of fine tuning and lots of evaluation is, would be a very interesting thing to work on. Yeah, I have a clarification question. And so here um, we're saying merging models are are we thinking about having a multitask model or? Yeah, so there, I'm talking about something a little more abstract, which is just that if I have, a, if I start from a model and you train it a bit and I train it a bit and we have two models now that implement are somehow better than the original model, how do we combine them so that it's better in the same ways without degrading performance somehow? <laughs> um, and uh, specifically, we're going to be applying this idea of merging to various settings like intermediate task training and domain adaptation, uh, which I'll talk about a little later. Okay, um, I think yeah. Nether has something written in the chat. Yeah, so so uh, Nether is um, pointing to this really nice uh, paper that uh, received best paper award at ACL 2020 um, that is a very good example of uh, some preliminary work towards what might be considered like unit testing uh, for, for pre-trained models. So th thanks for that pointer. Thanks. Cool. All right. So let's talk, let's talk about patches. So why, why is model patching hard? Like why is creating a cheaply communicable update to a pre-trained model difficult? So I will argue that the main reason for this comes from the way that we train most machine learning models these days, which is that we take the model, which has some particular set of parameters, and we compute the gradient with respect to some loss. Uh, uh, we compute the gradient of a loss with respect to all of the model's parameters, and then we take a step in the negative gradient direction for each parameter value. And crucially, what this means is that whenever we take a single step of training, a single iteration of training, we actually update all of the model's parameters, potentially, okay? So if I have a model, with a couple hundred million parameters and I take a single gradient step and I want to communicate the change that that single gradient step has implemented, that I have to communicate 
300 million values or a few hundred million, I guess is what I said, a few hundred million values. And if I trade the model for hundred iterations or a thousand iterations, it's always the same. I always have to communicate the full state of the model after any number of iterations of training. And you can imagine that if I want to keep track of a model over the course of all kinds of training that has been performed on the model, then I might have to store, I don't know, thousands of copies of the model. And I might, if I want to store or communicate that history, it can become prohibitively expensive. So the main idea behind this work is, is pretty simple. It's just, instead of updating all of the model's parameters, I'm gonna choose a small subset of the model's parameters and I'm only gonna update those instead, okay? Um, so that's visualized here. So the, the most important question that we have to answer now is how can we choose a small subset of the model's parameters to update? And I should mention the reason that this is a step towards patches is because if I only update a very small subset of the model's parameters, then I only need to up, I only need to communicate first of all which parameters were updated and second what are the updated values, which could be a lot cheaper to communicate and store than updating, uh, excuse me, than uh, communicating all of the model's parameters. So again, the, the most important question is how are we going to pick which parameters we're actually going to update? And so let's talk, let's talk this through. So let's, let's start from a simple idea, which is just that if I want to identify which parameters are most important, then I could measure the quantity shown on the screen here, which is I take the model, which we're calling P theta. So the model P with parameters theta, which you know, produces a conditional distribution over Y given some input X. And if I want to know which parameters are most important, then you can imagine that I'm going to perturb the parameters and see how much the model changes. So if I want to measure how much a probability distribution changes, I can measure the KL divergence. So I'm going to measure the KL divergence between the original model, uh, the output of the original model, and the output of a model whose parameters have been slightly perturbed. Okay, so the perturbation, depending on which parameters it perturbs and how much it perturbs them by, will tell us which uh, parameters the model is most sensitive to, the model's output is most sensitive to. So if we take this quantity and uh, expand it to second order, we get what's shown on the right here. In particular, we get this term, this quadratic term that relates to a matrix called the Fisher information matrix, which we're writing as F sub theta. And the Fisher information matrix is defined as follows. Uh, it's defined by you can kind of think of it like taking an outer product of the gradients of the log probability of the model, okay? And so this is a matrix which has as many rows and columns as there are parameters and relates back to the original question we said in a pretty direct way. You can think of it as approximating the, uh, the scale divergence between the model and the perturbed model. Uh, you can think of it as approximating it as an important component in approximating that to a second order. The trouble with this quantity is that it, as I mentioned, has as many rows and columns as there are parameters in the model, which means that the number of values in this matrix is quadratic in the number of parameters of the model. And if we're going to be using models with lots of parameters, as, as we will, uh, then this matrix will be extremely expensive to compute and store, basically impossible. So we're going to use a simple approximation to the Fisher information matrix where we're only going to compute the diagonal of the matrix, okay? And it turns out, well, actually, we're going to approximate it in two ways. The first way is to only compute the diagonal. And the second way is we're going to do the thing that we often do in machine learning, which is that we're going to estimate this expectation over sampling from the data distribution P of X as an average uh, over a training set. So these are X sub I. Uh, and we have n examples in our training set. So we just take an average over n uh, of each of the x sub i in our training set. And we get this approximation that's shown here because uh, we're taking this outer product, the diagonal terms are basically the, the square gradient of the log probability. Uh, and we still include this expectation over samples from the model. Uh, and, and, but that's, you know, a relatively easy thing to do. We can either compute the expectation exactly for a classification model, or, or we can approximate it somehow. But crucially on the diagonal, there are only as many entries as there are parameters. So this object is not terribly expensive to compute or store 
And it also has a very intuitive kind of interpretation, which is that each of these diagonal Fisher values denote how important that parameter is, or at least it loosely approximates a notion of how important those parameters are. Because we're basically just measuring if I take the gradient of the log probability of the, that the model has produced with respect to a particular parameter and I square that gradient, I'm basically saying, if I, if I take the gradient, I'm measuring how, what's the rate of change of that log probability and I square it, I'm basically computing how much does the model's output change as that value changes. Uh, and you can tie that back to the original quantity we mentioned, or you can just think of it in the intuitive way that I just described. Okay, so now we're armed with our approximation to effectively parameter importance. So what we'll do is we'll take a model, we'll compute this approximate fissure, and then we'll take the top K largest values along that diagonal. And that'll tell us that what K parameters contribute the most to the changes in the model's output. And if K is very small compared to the total number of parameters in the model, then communicating the updated values of those parameters will be a lot cheaper than communicating the updated values of all of the parameters in the model. So we can just perform gradient-based training as usual, except that we leave all of the model's parameters fixed, and we only update those models that have the top K largest values in our diagonal Fisher approximation. Doing this, we call the Fisher-induced sparse unchanging mask. We say it's a mask because you can kind of think of it like a mask over the model's parameters. And we say it's sparse because the mask is zero in most places. And now some of you might be thinking, okay, we're talking about sparse subset of model parameters. That sounds a lot like the lottery ticket hypothesis or sparse networks, but I'll emphasize that we're not actually computing a sparse model. We're just computing sparse updates to the model's parameters. So it's not true that all of the model's parameters or most of the model's parameters are zero. We're just not updating most of them. We're leaving most of them fixed, at least over a, num a certain number of iterations of training. So another thing that this might have reminded you of is the paradigm of parameter efficient transfer learning, where the goal is to take a pre-trained model and update as few parameters as possible and still get good performance on a downstream task. And our fish mask is applicable to the setting and we need a benchmark to figure out how good it is. So we tested out this idea on parameter efficient transfer learning. So along the x-axis is the map, what we call the mask sparsity. You can see, think of it as the percentage of parameters that we are updating. Uh, so for some particular K that corresponds to, for example, 0.1% of the model parameters. And we can take a pre-trained model, in this case, BERT large, and fine tune it on some particular data set. In this case, uh, the, uh, the glue sort of meta benchmark. And we can measure the model's performance when we're only updating a small subset of the model's parameters. And that's what's shown in kind of the actual green bars here. As a simple baseline, we can just choose a random subset of the model parameters and update only those instead. And you can see that does much worse. So this kind of just validates that our approach to choosing which parameters are most important actually does identify parameters that are more effective uh, when updated uh, during fine tuning. Uh, I see that there's a question, is this, is this a fixed mirror mask or is it changing an iteration? So that, that's an important point that I may not have emphasized enough, which is that for these experiments and well, for all of the experiments, we fix the mask, we, we, we pre-compute this mask and we keep it fixed over many iterations of training. In the parameter efficient transfer learning uh, experiments that I'm describing now, we keep the max fixed over the entire duration of fine tuning. So we, we identify the subset of the parameters before we start fine tuning by computing the diagonal fissure over the fine tuning data set. And then we keep it fixed and only update those parameters throughout all of fine tuning. <clears throat> We can also compare our method to other methods that identify a sparse subset of parameters and only update those. Um, these are again, typically called parameter efficient fine tuning methods. And you can see that we compare favorably to those methods. We're not comparing to adapter style methods or prompt tuning style methods, because those are methods that add parameters to the model. And they actually tend in some cases to work significantly better in terms of like the accuracy sparsity or not sparsity in that case, but the accuracy versus number of parameters trade-off. But when we compare to different methods that 
choose a subset of the model parameters and only update those, you can see that uh, we compare pretty favorably, which is nice. The other setting, common setting, where we can benchmark fish mask is in distributed training. So in distributed training, we are we have a, a set of workers which are training individual copies of the model and on their own sets of data. And then they're communicating the changes back to a central coordinator. And the goal in distributed training is often to minimize the communication costs between the workers and the centralized server. And you can minimize those costs either by making it so that the workers communicate with the server less often, right? Or you can minimize those costs by making it so that the workers have to communicate less by using something like fish mask. So you can see this black line here is if we just have the workers communicate all parameters back to the model, but we minimize communication costs along the x axis by having them communicate less often. And this I should mention is a distributed training setup with two workers on CIFAR 10, which is a common image classification benchmark. Now, if you use the fish mask instead, you kind of have two dials to decide how much you're going to minimize the communication costs. You can either lower the sparsity or you can lower the, the uh, frequency of communication. And if you use, for example, a 10% sparsity in the, with the dark green line, you can see that you get a better communication versus performance trade-off than you would have just using dense updates. So not using the fish mask. If you set the sparsity to 2% and get the light green line, you can see that actually that does degrade performance. You can't recover a good model by only communicating 2% of the model parameters. And again, if you use a random mask, it works significantly worse. It uh, looks like we had a question. Does this sparse mask ensure that it yields to an improvement compared to the previous model? Um, I wouldn't say that it, uh, if, you're, if you're referring to the pre-trained model, uh, I wouldn't say it ensures that the performance improves, but we do find in practice that updating a small subset of the model's parameters does produce a model that can uh, perform uh, well on the downstream task, which is the goal of transfer learning. Okay, so I talked about a small step towards patching. Now let's talk about a small step towards merging. Um, and I think actually, since, yeah, maybe since I've been answering questions throughout, I will, I'll just forge onward rather than stopping for questions there. And feel free to ping the chat with more questions or interrupt me. So in order to motivate merging, which we were talking about uh, a little bit earlier, uh, I will discuss some different paradigms of transfer learning. Uh, so in traditional transfer learning, like we've been talking about in this talk, we start with a pre-trained model shown in as a blue circle here. And then we perform additional training on some downstream task to get a new model shown in green. Okay, so this is one paradigm of transfer learning. Another paradigm is to do what's called intermediate task training, where rather than just taking the pre-trained model and fine tuning on the downstream task, you first train it on an intermediate task, which is different from the downstream task, but that hopefully produces a better model after you do the final downstream fine tuning step. The kind of canonical example of this, at least in NLP, is to take a pre-trained language model, fine tune it on MNLI, and then fine tune it on RTE. And that can produce a much better model than if you just fine tune on RTE directly. But suffice it to say, this can be a helpful step. This is also basically the setup for what's called domain adaptive pre-training or task adaptive pre-training. Uh, where there is a intermediate step before fine tuning where we train the model either on different data or a different objective. So let's talk about another way to achieve a similar goal. You can imagine that we start with our pre-trained model shown in blue and we train it on uh, separately on the intermediate task and on the downstream task. Okay, so we're not gonna do this sequential fine tuning. We just took the original model and fine tuned it twice separately, once on the intermediate task and once on the downstream task. Now the question is, can we take these two fine-tuned models and combine them in a way that they work as well or roughly as well as if we had done actual sequential intermediate task training? So can we take the green model and make it better by somehow pulling in knowledge and information and skills, loosely speaking, from the, the intermediate task model? And that is what I will call model merging. So it's ideally a way of taking two models which have been 
which are derived from the same model but have been improved in some way and combining them so that we ingest the improvements from both of them. And you can see this kind of gives you a different paradigm for doing transfer learning. And in particular, it might enable new paths of, of transfer across models. So in transfer learning, we're kind of transferring capabilities sequentially in you know, one after the other uh, as we train on one task or after another task. In model merging, we might hope to do kind of weirder ways of transferring knowledge. Like you could imagine we take a blue, blue, blue model, we do a couple of steps of intermediate task training and then separately train it on a different task. And now we want to take a, take a uh, some of these various models and combine their capabilities to create a new model that works well on, on a bunch of these tasks or just works particularly well on one task by incorporating capabilities from multiple models. There really isn't any way to do this with traditional sequential transfer learning, but model merging might enable this kind of thing. So let's talk about how we might do this. So one way of thinking about the underlying goal of model merging would be this optimization problem that's shown on the screen here. So if starting from the right, if we can compute the model, the posterior distribution of model parameters with respect to some particular data set, so parameters theta and data set D sub i, then we might hope to maximize the kind of aggregate post the sum of the posterior distributions across all of the data sets in all of the tasks that the intermediate models were trained on. Okay. Um, and so we're essentially, you can think of us as taking the posteriors, summing them up to get an aggregate posterior and finding the peak of the sum of these posteriors. And we've also added a little hyperparameter lambda i. We add that because in some cases we care more about, let's say, the downstream task than the intermediate task. So that lets us trade that off. Uh, but for the moment, we can, we can ignore that. And so this would hopefully give us a parameter value, which has a high probability under the posterior of each individual model, each model that was trained on the different data sets. So now we're going through all of the labels of what I just said. Um, the trouble is that we can't actually, we, in practice, the way that we train machine learning models, we can't actually compute this posterior distribution. Usually we perform training to uh, attain the maximum a posteriori estimate of the uh, posterior, which is basically, uh, hopefully, the maximum of the posterior, but in practice might just be a, a maxima at best. Um, but at any rate, it's a point estimate of the posterior. We, we don't have access to the full posterior distribution for the way that we that people typically train machine learning models these days. Okay, so if we want to perform this optimization over model posteriors, then we're going to need to make some kind of approximation again. Okay, so the approximation that we're going to make is called the Laplace approximation, and the first step in the Laplace approximation is to approximate the posterior as a normal distribution. And it turns out that the, a good approximation of the posterior can be obtained by using the Hessian of the model as the precision matrix. And the Hessian is the matrix of second derivatives with respect to the model's parameters. The trouble is that the Hessian, like the Fisher that we talked about before, is quadratic in the number of model parameters. There are uh, as many uh, rows and columns as there are parameters in the model. So not only is it expensive to store and compute, it's also expensive to invert. And since we're using the Hessian as the precision matrix, we'll need to invert it in order to evaluate the pro this probability distribution. Um, fortunately, if it turns out that if we're at a mode of the posterior, which we hopefully will be after trading, uh, then we can use the Fisher information matrix. Actually, sorry, I'm getting a call that I need to answer. Give me, sorry to do this, but give me one second. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I was saying that if we are at a mode of the posterior, 
then we can approximate, we can make a further approximation uh, and use the Fisher information matrix. But you might be able to tell by now, based on our discussion earlier, that we won't be able to compute this Fisher information matrix because it's quadratic in the number of model parameters. And we won't be able to invert it because that would be extremely expensive for a model that's so large, uh, excuse for a matrix that's so large, I should say. So what will we do? We'll use our old friend from the previous paper, the diagonal Fisher. The diagonal Fisher is tractable to compute, tractable to store. And crucially, it's also tractable to invert because if we want to invert a diagonal matrix, we just need to take the reciprocal of, all, or the inverse of all of the uh, diagonal entries. So this is okay, we're good to go. So this is how we will approximate the posterior of each model. We're gonna compute the model's uh, diagonal Fisher and we'll compute a normal distribution that uses that Fisher as the uh, precision matrix. And now we have an approximate posterior for each model, and we can actually solve this optimization problem in closed form. So let's actually give an example of how all well this works. So if we do intermediate task merging, so this is a, equivalent to the intermediate task uh, transfer learning setup that I described uh, at, the, at the beginning of this section. And we take BERT base and we fine tune it on all of the glue tasks plus squad. And then we treat all of the glue tasks as a target task that I want to improve the performance of by using the intermediate task models. Then I get a performance boost shown by the heat map on the right. And we can see here that actually the case where we get the biggest boost is by using MNLI as an intermediate model and using RTE as the the target model, which is a little yellow box there. And you can see we actually get a, a basically a 10% improvement in performance on RTE by merging the RTE fine-tuned model with an MNLI fine-tuned model. And the nice thing here is that as long as someone has taken BERT and fine-tuned it on a particular model, uh, I can just grab that model and try merging it with my model and see if I get a boost in the performance. I don't have to perform any additional training. I just need to compute the approximate Fisher, which is relatively inexpensive, and solve this closed form optimization problem. And I can immediately see if I get a boost in performance. And because lots of people have taken pre-trained models and fine-tuned them on different tasks, there are lots of fine-tuned models out there available that I can use to try to boost the performance on my downstream task. And you can see that we get a nice boost in performance on RTE, a reasonable boost in other cases, but really the, the best case is, is on RTE. We can also try some more esoteric merging patterns like I hinted at the beginning of this section. So in this case, you can imagine that we took a pre-trained model, we fine-tuned that model on MNLI, and then we took that model and fine-tuned it on another task. And then separately, we took the original pre-trained model and fine-tuned it on some other task. So we call the green task here, that the one that didn't undergo MNLI intermediate task training, the donor model. And then we take the model that used MNLI intermediate task training and, and use that as the target model to target task. So we want to improve the performance of the model that underwent MNLI intermediate task training by incorporating the uh, donor model. Um, so again, we, for donor tasks, we consider every task on glue, including squad. Uh, and for the target task, we can consider the three tasks here. And an interesting thing is that if, for example, so again, RTE tends to see the largest gains, but one interesting thing is that if you use MNLI as the donor model, even though we did MNLI intermediate task training, we still see a boost on RTE. Um, but we also see boosts uh, on other data sets uh, and uh, both in terms of the donor task and the target task. So finally, just one other example of a case where people have considered what amounts to intermediate task training uh, for uh, domain adaptive free training. We can see that we also get nice performance boosts from merging. So in domain adaptive pre-training, what this effectively amounts to is taking the pre-trained model, doing continued pre-training on data from some particular domain, and then in the typical setup, doing addition, additional fine-tuning on the task that we care about that is in that domain. In our case, we can take the original model, fine-tune it on the uh, domain-specific unlabeled data, and fine-tune it separately on the domain-specific task, and merge those two models and 
um, do what amounts to domain adaptive pre-training. And you can see, interestingly, uh, in, in some cases, doing model merging actually works a bit better than fine tuning in our setup and certainly works better than uh, not using the domain adaptive model at all, which is in the unmerged column. So to recap, today I've been making the case that we should try to develop the tools and the research required to enable us to collaboratively and continually develop pre-trained models. And I've provided two small steps towards that eventual goal. The first was to make it possible to communicate patches to models, which are cheaply communicable updates, as well as uh, merging models. So taking two models that are derived from the same model and combining their capabilities to create a new model that hopefully works as well or better as the individual models. But these are just two kind of components of this larger scale goal. And there are two small steps towards those components. Um, but other components that I would identify uh, for future work, one of them is what uh, Kalpesh brought up a, a bit earlier, um, the ability to rapidly evaluate the proposed changes to a model. So this is what people do in uh, open source software development uh, or software development in general that is called unit testing or continuous integration. So if someone submits a possible change to me, hopefully I will be able to rapidly evaluate whether uh, the change will improve performance and hopefully not degrade performance and maintain back sort of backwards compatibility with all of the previous uh, tasks that the model had been uh, applied to. Uh, it raises interesting questions about how to tell if a model still works well on the things that you care about without exhaustively fine tuning it on every task that the model could possibly be applicable to and then evaluating the performance. Um, the other piece that is a part of kind of the open source software ecosystem or just the software ecosystem is the ability to kind of recombine different software components to create new software. So for example, if I'm writing Python code and I wanna be able to easily parse JSON files then I just import the JSON library and that gives my code, my piece of software, the capability of processing JSON files. Um, we don't have that kind of functionality for machine learning models. You know, if I have a model that can process images I can't just import a vision processing module uh, or I can't import, for example, a knowledge based processing module to give the model access to a lot more knowledge. Um, I, but nevertheless, I think this would be a very useful capability that uh, starts to become reasonable to start thinking about and talking about when you start thinking about version control of machine learning models. Um, so I think I'll end there. The two papers that I discussed today are shown on the screen here. They were done, uh, most of the work was done by my uh, excellent students. Um, I'll also say that I've started to try to get feedback from people on what they thought of my talks, because it's not the kind of feedback that you usually get. Uh, but you all have now watched me give a talk. So I would love to hear if you think that I spoke too quickly, too slowly. I covered too much technical detail, not enough. If it made sense, if you like the slides, all of that stuff, uh, please give me free form anonymous feedback at the link on the bottom of the screen here. And I'm happy to take more questions now. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful talk. Oh, Kalpesh had a question. Okay, let's see. Given the small size of adapters or patches, plus ability to merge, oops. Plus ability to merge adapters via adapter fusion, MADX, modular nature of adapters, is there any specific disadvantage of adding more parameters for an open source ecosystem for model development? Yeah, so I, I do think that it absolutely should be true that a version control system for continual development of models should support the operation of adding or removing parameters, right? Because whether you're adding an adapter uh, or you're just adding a you know, new output to the model or you know, using a kind of like a net to net framework to grow the model, whatever, it definitely should be supported. The thing that I would, the, the caveat that I would say is that if the only way to modify the model would be 
to add parameters to it, it would become onerous. It just just do normal training of the model. So if you know if if I want to take your pre-trained model and improve it, and I add an adapter to the model and I don't update the existing parameters, and everyone who changes the model is adding adapters, it might become it might get out of hand quickly in terms of the size of the model and also just like basically the computational graph of the model. But but I do totally agree that that would be an important operation to support. Uh, it looks like I've got another question about whether improving the, um, basically improving the approximation of the Fisher uh, matrix could improve the accuracy. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question and would be a great uh, experiment to consider for follow-up work. Um, there has been a lot of, so most of the time when you see the Fisher information matrix come up, it's in the context of optimization kind of as a preconditioner for gradient descent. And there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of great work on better approximations to the Fisher. Uh, we wanted to try that in both of these papers, but just didn't get around to it because the very, very simple and easy to compute diagonal Fisher was, uh, was enough for us to see good performance. Yeah, Andrew. Are you also taking questions live? I don't know <clears throat> how this works. <laughs> um, so what a delightful talk. I love this so much. Um, and I'm sorry that I missed the beginning of it. Um, so this may be off base. But um, when averaging a collection of parameters from different models, even though they all were derived from the same pre-trained model, I might be concerned that some of that post-training um, moved some of the um, like uh, uh, um, the latent variables far enough apart that averaging them together doesn't make sense anymore. Um, am I on the wrong page? Is that a real concern? I, I think that's a completely reasonable concern. The very surprising or the, uh, the potentially surprising thing is that for, and, and obviously throughout this talk, I've just been talking about uh, large neural networks. For large neural networks trained with gradient descent, Averaging together the model's parameters really doesn't seem to be a major issue. So a very strong baseline actually for both of for uh, both of the papers that I talked about today is uh, is just using basically uh, you could think of it in the case of model merging as uh, isotropic Gaussian, which just means averaging the model's parameters, no Fisher weighting, nothing. And that's actually what's commonly done in federated learning, which is this super distributed optimization paradigm. Um, and it works surprisingly well, uh, especially one, when the two models are derived from the same original model, and two, when the uh, tasks or the data, I should say, that the models were trained on is not so different, uh, which is, you know, in the case of intermediate task training and domain adaptive pre-training and so on is, is definitely the case. But if you start to train the models on completely different tasks, especially on data that's not at all like the pre-training data, and you train them for long enough and you try to average them together, it doesn't work as well. And again, as I, as I mentioned, this is a major concern in federated learning. And there's actually been a lot of work to try to make federated work, learning work better when the data from each worker is very differently distributed. And the nice thing is that we can kind of import <laughs> some of those findings uh, into the setting of merging models. And, and so really the question of why that's the case, uh, I think that's that's an open question. Uh, interesting, mm -hmm. something that would be interesting to study empirically or theoretically. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I don't know if there's a stack of other questions here that I don't want to interrupt, but I have I have another one. Uh, there's nobody else waiting in line. Um, let me look. It doesn't seem to be anything else at the moment. I don't know whether you saw a paper that recently appeared on Archive. The last author is Percy. Um, in which they compare the traditional kind of fine tuning that from the very beginning sends gradient signals all the way down into the pre-trained model versus one that begins training by fitting just the newly added parameters at the very top of the model, keeping the rest of the pre-trained fixed. And then later, once that's settled, the top part is settled, sending some gradient signals down at the pre-trained model. And they get like much better cross-domain um, um, robustness from mm -hmm. the latter. And it's just, not exactly what you're talking about um, uh, here, I understand, but I wonder if you had thoughts or comments and how that might interact with um, um, yeah, some of the main goals of your talk. Yeah, I think I think that to me, the closest bridge there is an interesting issue in the fish mask paper, which is basically that if you want to compute the fissure, 
or the approximate fissure before you've done any training, which is what we want to do, right? Because we want to get this mask and then use that mask for subsequent training. Mm -hmm. And we're taking a pre-trained model and applying it to a new task, which is the case in transfer learning. Then we're computing the fissure through a random classifier, which is kind of a little bit odd. Uh, yeah. But it actually turns out to work fine, which is interesting because what that kind of means is that the representation learned by BERT is reasonably separable via random projection, right? Uh, so if I just if I'm doing binary classification and I feed in a, a negative sent, uh, let's say I'm doing sentiment analysis, I feed in a negative sentiment thing, and then I have my negative sentiment random vector and my positive sentiment random vector. It kind of it must kind of be a reasonable starting point just to sample random vectors and to do a random projection, which you know maybe isn't too surprising when you think of all of the linguistic capabilities that people have found that the pre-trained BERT model has, uh, and the fact that you know random projections can preserve distances to some extent. Um, but nevertheless, like uh, uh, th then the question is, what are the limits of that? And one of the um, experimental details that I swept under the rug over the course of this talk was that when we do the, the distributed training experiments in the fish mass paper, we actually uh, do some training first before we compute the fish mass. Uh, and if you don't do that, it doesn't work at all because the fissure is just not reliable. So it'd be interesting to think about, you know, in, in, the, in the domain adaptation or transfer learning setting that you were describing, you know, how much does it help actually to just train the classifier a bit first? It sounds like it potentially could help a lot. Interesting. All right, let's see here. Again, I have some other possible follow-ups, but let me let me let somebody else jump in. Um, um, if like. Looks like, is that pronounced Nader or not? Uh, Nader. Nader, Hi. Okay. Hi. Great, great talk, thank you. Um, so, uh, I kind of wanted to follow up on the notion of the sort of Git uh, as a approach that we're trying to get close to, um, you know, version control. Um, part of it, like you said, is with DVC, you have a combination of code and data that's checkpointed together. Um, but one of the things that you're talking about is trying to be able to merge histories. I'm not entirely certain how we can uh, accomplish that when there's both additions and subtractions to the model. So the code changes in addition to the parameters of, of the model changing. Um, yeah. You know, it, it becomes a little bit difficult to figure out what the um, outcome of the model will be in that case uh, when you've done both changes at the same time. Yeah, so so even not thinking about the code specifically, I mean, I think when you say code, you're kind of thinking about like the model building code, which you know you can kind of think of like as a way to the construct. architecture. Yeah, the architecture. Yeah. So one example, there are a couple of examples of that that I think it would be possible. One simple example is uh, if you add an adapter, like a task adapter, and I mean the traditional task adapters, and uh, train that on one particular task, then I can add another adapter in parallel for my task, and they don't conflict. Uh, similarly, if you have uh, an instance-based model that's retrieving uh, instances and conditioning on them in some way, I can add and remove instances without necessarily conflicting with the instances that you're adding or removing or modifying. I mean, the simplest example is if you imagine that we're doing version control of a k-nearest neighbor classifier, then you could you could modify one of the data points and I can modify another one of the data points and they probably wouldn't conflict. And, and in that sense, the merging is basically trivial. Um, but for more complicated operations, you know, where we are really modifying the, like if you delete five layers and I update the parameters of those layers, then yeah, that's a merge conflict. What are we going to do? Uh, and actually that brings up a bigger question, which is like, if you can't do merging by averaging parameters or trivially because you're, uh, because of the types of updates you're doing, how do you then kind of aggregate knowledge from two models? Well, that starts to sound a lot like distillation, right? So how can I take two models that can do certain things and train one model that ingests all of the capabilities of those models? Uh, that sounds like distillation to me, which is, to me, it feels like, um, you know, in, in software development, when there's a real merge conflict, it means that the developer has to go and manually 
fix it, which is very time consuming sometimes and can be difficult. To me, distillation is like the equivalent of um, resolving a merge conflict. <laughs> Looks like there's a, really yeah, absolutely. It. Thanks for the question. Looks like uh, two has a question. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm uh, in a medical appointment <laughs> waiting for my doctor. And I, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, uh, for model merging, did you try any experiment on uh, scaling up the number of models uh, or the number of tasks, uh, perhaps uh, using a, a huge number of uh, models? Uh, can mitigate some uh, negative chamfer or task interference issues. Um, and the, uh, the second question I have is that uh, in the current uh, chamfer learning framework, you, you are using a single underlying model. Uh, so do you think that it could be extensible to the case of uh, when we have multiple underlying models like BERT and T5 and many other, other models and we chamfer between different models? Yeah, yeah, those are really interesting questions. I think the first one especially is a good way of testing the limits of our approach, because to your point, yeah, that merging, if I wanted to merge 12 models, that it wouldn't be trivial to do that with traditional transfer learning, especially with you know things like catastrophic forgetting and so on. We did try that and all the experiments we tried, the model, did, there was no real gain in performance, at least in the settings that we tried. Um, basically the model, you know, you maybe used some amount of one of the models uh, in addition to the target task model, um, but it, 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 didn't, it didn't provide any benefits. It kind of was ignoring the other ones, which I think is a, a limitation of our method more than anything, because it's ultimately pretty primitive. We're taking a weighted average of the model parameters, essentially. Um, and I think uh, actually the Michael, the student who's working on this, now working on another project, which is trying to more directly characterize you know, what are kind of like the underlying components of a model? What are, what are its capabilities? How can we identify them and then decompose them and recombine them? And you can imagine like kind of the, the killer app for that line of work would be, you know, I have a thousand fine-tuned models and I have on, on a thousand tasks and I have a new task, an unseen task. How do I take those a thousand task models and combine them in a way that it does well on the new task without any training at all? Um, and, uh, and I, I think that would be very interesting. And the method that I described today, I don't think would is powerful enough to do that. Um, it's too simple. Um, the multiple underlying models, we didn't try. It, it'd be interesting. I mean, the, the tricky thing is that there, I don't think there are too many examples of the, the trick. Again, a, a limitation of the method is that in order to average together model parameters, it has to be the same exact model architecture. And really in order for excuse me, some of the assumptions that we made in the Laplace approximation to really make sense, um, they need to be kind of nearby in parameter space to some extent. Um, so if you take, even if you took two BERT models trained from scratch on two different data sets, I, I'm skeptical that, that it would work. Um, and again, this is more highlighting the simplicity of the approach and the, its limitations than, than saying that those aren't really interesting ideas to work on. Yeah, cool, thanks. Cool. I will also say that if anyone um, thinks of other things they want to ask or follow up on, I'm, I, I love to get emails and chat about this stuff more too. Yeah. Um, are there any follow-up questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe other people, if you have any questions, you could follow up with um, Professor Raffle and just Thanks again for the wonderful talk. I think it's really exciting and personally really looking forward to the uh, follow up steps of this line of work. Lots of possibilities there. Um, yeah, even wondering whether it's possible to either train or pre train such that the later merging or patching is easier. Just a lot of possibilities. Definitely. Anyway, thanks again. And uh, we can all unmute ourselves and give Professor Ruffle a round of applause. Um, thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the invite. Bye. Bye.